Good morning, Highland Church. Good to have you all with us. It looks like it's a little bit of a smaller crowd than normal, and I know a lot of people are traveling this weekend. It's a little bit of a longer weekend for some. And I think it's interesting that several of our musicians from our church are doing music at other churches this week, and we have musicians from another church come and do music for us. So welcome. Thank you for joining us, Sandy and Donna. So I have several things I wanted to cover just by way of announcements for you as we get started. First one is, if you're visiting us today, or for some reason you need to get a hold of the office, check out the Connect card, which is in the pew in front of you. We would love to know you're here if you're visiting. If there's some way we can minister to you, please check that out. And then you can just take this card, you can give it to either the pastors, myself, or Pastor Benji, or elders, or the easiest way maybe just to stick it in the offering box in the back, right through those double doors. So that's something you can check out. Also in the same pew is our prayer cards. And we have a little bit different order of service than normal, but uh, Pastor John will be leading a prayer song, and when that happens, you can come forward and put them in Elder Twig's Bible, and then the elders will pray over these prayer requests throughout this week. So go ahead and fill those out now. If you look in your bulletin, you'll notice that it went very quickly from just a few announcements to this week. It is packed in there. And there's some things that didn't even get in there. I'm not going to highlight all of the things that didn't get in there, be, or that did get in there, because you can read those for yourselves. But um, one thing I do need to cover is we have some membership transfers that are doing their second reading. So for those who are members here, we just need to vote these here. Uh, Karen and Bob Shimp are transferring in from the Cross Plains Seventh-day Adventist Church. And also, Kim Ship is coming from the Covenant SDA Church in Gallatin, Tennessee. So, is there a motion to welcome them? Another? All right. Everybody in favor say, welcome. welcome. All right. And we have... Um, Laverne Williams and Ewan Morgan are moving to the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church in Florida. And so is there a motion to transfer them out? Okay, the second. All in favor say goodbye. <laughs> All right. So that's taken care of. Next week is Education Sabbath. That's the Sabbath when Highland Elementary School and Highland Middle School, they take over the church service and... I know they've been working on some skits, some music, some great stuff. So you want to come out and check that out. And that begins the month of April, which, no fooling, is a busy month at Highland Church. So first week is Education Sabbath. Then on the 13th is Academy Days. This is a time when students come to preview Highland Academy. If you have somebody going into high school, this is the time to do it. Now... We'll be doing this just slightly different from normal. We're having our regular Sabbath school classes that week, and then the church service will be combined with the academy. The academy is doing their own Sabbath school class up there at their gym. So then on the 27th is Alumni Weekend, another busy week for us. And so it is going to be a busy but good April. So keep those things in mind. We have good news from the Pathfinders. You want to come on up, Pathfinders? Last week was the Union Pathfinder Bible Experience event, and we did pretty good in that. I'll let you all take over. He's taller than me. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. How are you today? Um, I am so happy to stand in front of you today and tell you that we had a team yet again get first place in the Union competition. So, these are some of the girls that are on that team. For the first time, though, we did have two teams go to the union, or the union level competition. So, we had first place in area, both teams, both first place in conference, and then we had a first and a third in union. Um, when I tell you guys that these children are not just reading the books of the Bible, and learning some stories, they are studying and memorizing God's Word. It is impressive what these, these children are able to do. Um, they have spent almost a year studying the books of Joshua and Judges and have literally memorized these words 
to where they can be asked a question as simple as, in Joshua 7.14, what did Jesus say and who was he speaking to? Something as vague as that, you and I would have no idea. And these kids are able to recite that. And so I'm so proud of them. Um, while we're proud of them, it does take money to fund the things that they need to go and do. The division competition is going to be in Denver, Colorado this year. They'll be competing with teams around the world. Last year, they had teams from China, South Korea, Canada, um, and Hawaii, which is not from around the world, but it's not our continental United States. But um, it's, it's an experience that these kids really have earned. And so I want to encourage you guys to support them. And we're doing that by offering an, a burden lifted off of your shoulders. Um, our fundraiser that we're going to try and do is to offer a meal for you that we will prepare a meal for you and bring it to you within a reasonable distance. Sorry, Grandma in another state. We'll have to figure something else out there. But we'll have Pathfinders out front in the lobby after the service with flyers for more information for you. And if dinner doesn't interest you, then any type of monetary donation, as simple as five, ten dollars everything really does help. And so I wanna tell you that we appreciate all of your support that you guys give to the Pathfinder Club in general but especially for our PVE kids and all the hard work that they put into studying God's word. I've been watching PVE now for several years. As my son's been in, I think this is third or fourth year in PVE. They really do a lot of studying, a lot of it. And it's, and it's not just studying, but what's fascinating is when in conversation they start dropping scriptures in because they know them. That's exciting to me. I know I had somebody contact me this week who is no longer a member of this church. He's moved, but he heard that our club was going. He said, can I make a donation? I said, no, we only take money from church members. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. You can give online at highlandadventist.org slash give, and you can select Pathfinders. But if you want to make sure it goes for PBE, you need to let somebody know, either the Pathfinder Club, let, let somebody in the office say, hey, this $100,000 that I gave, I mean this... This, this money that I gave was intended for PBE, and we'll make sure that it gets spent specifically for that. So, um, so congratulations to our PBE teams. At this time, let's get the worship going. Let's stand for opening prayer and remain standing for our opening hymn. Dear Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be in your house together today. And as we celebrate you and specifically this weekend, most of Christianity is celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're so thankful for those things that have transformed our life and set us free. Now set us free in your spirit to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to sing? 167, also on the screen behind me, all three verses.
may be seated. If I were to sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy to my heart. One more time. I've got the joy, 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 joy into my heart. Thank you. Let's do that.
Is it not a privilege to be an academy church? What a blessing. We, we take it for granted. It, it's really something. Our offering today is for church budget. That comes around pretty regular. We all know what that's for. But uh, we got Pathfinders. They need a little boosting up. Church budget always needs a little boosting up. We got a building fund. We want to pay that off. We got all kind of things going on in this church. All kind of things. You think, is there no end to the calls, the need? No, there's not. Matter of fact, it's going to increase. And you need to be planning for that. You need to step out in faith. I have said before, when I stand up here, I see the most giving people on earth. Give a little more. Give a little more than you planned on. Sometimes, maybe give a little more than you can and see what God does. I'm going to tell you a story, and I'll get off out of your way. Years ago, I made a similar plea. Bill Collier, you all remember Bill? He came to me about three weeks later, and he was smiling. He said, you know what? He said, I took what you said to heart. He said, I, I'm going to give a little more. I'm going to give a little more maybe than I can. And he said, you know what the result was? And I was smiling. I said, no, nope, tell me. He said, the transmission went out in my car. <laughs> that wasn't what I expected. But he was still smiling, and he said, you know what? I had some money come in I wasn't planning on, and it all worked out fine. That's the way God works. If we let him, we need to let him. There's a lot of ways to give. We have the box out back. You can give online. You can uh, drop it by the church office. You can give it to a pastor. You can even trust me with it. It'll get where it's supposed to go. But give and see what God can do for you. Give him the opportunity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you love us so much that you try to make us fit for heaven. You want us to be in heaven with you, and you give us a chance to give, to tamp down self, and to give. We're grateful for that, and as we give, we ask that you would use these gifts to further your work to accomplish the needs of this church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on down, children, for the children's story. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
morning, guys. Thank you guys for bringing down all those dollars. How would all the adults came down here by themselves and put that in without your help? It would have been a crowd, and you guys did it for them. So thank you. I want to tell you guys a story today, but I want to ask you a question first. Have you ever heard a big adult word and not know what it meant? I hear them all the time. People confuse me for being an adult. I think it's because of my age. So I want to tell you guys a story, but first I want to share one of my favorite Bible verses. It says, it says, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So I want to tell you a story about when I was little and I heard the word redeem and I didn't know what it meant. So I'm going to read it. It says, when I was a little boy, I remember going to my first football game. My friend's dad drove us to the stadium, and I remember walking toward this enormous stadium and reading the sign that said, Adelphia Coliseum. This big stadium had big concrete pillars, and between the words where it said Adelphia and Coliseum was this, the biggest glass wall I had ever seen. I was in awe. I followed close behind my friend and his dad, yet my undiagnosed ADD was taking my attention in a million different directions. I smelled cooking hot dogs. I heard the sound of ruckus music and people shouting words that I was told never to say. And out of all of these things vying for my attention, one word kept ringing in my mind. Would you like to guess what it was? Redeem. You see, before we got out of the car, my friend's dad had turned to us and said, guys, we need to go to Will Call to redeem our tickets. It was a mystery to me. Young or old, I've never been one to be found speechless, right? But I was found speechless because he said, we need to go to Will Call to redeem our tickets. And I was like, Will Call? Huh, what's that? And redeem? You mean like what Jesus did on the cross? And Will Call? Who is Will? And why are we going to call him? Does he have our tickets? And, and why do the tickets need to be redeemed? Did they do something wrong? Are they in trouble? Did they do something bad? Is this some sort of lost and found? Well, the sounds of the stadium seemed to pour out of its walls. My mind struggled to process the sound of screaming fans and the echoing of the PA, kind of like this. They talk with a loud voice. But nothing troubled my young mind more than the word redeem. Why do these tickets need to be redeemed? My imagination was going faster than my feet. Was my friend's dad going to save the tickets from destruction? Maybe Will Call would have the answer. But who was Will? And how were we going to call him? My mind raced through thoughts. And by a miracle, I hadn't been separated from my friends yet. Somehow, I was following the shirt tail of my friend. And as we trailed behind his dad through lines and lines of people, and finally we broke through the last group. And there on the wall, W-I-L-L-C-A-L-L, -L -L, will call, I muttered to myself. Oh, so it's a place. But no phone booth, nobody named William, no bills, no willies, just a table and some official-looking people and had boxes in front of them that were labeled with little letters and organized according to the alphabet. They greeted us. Are you here to claim some tickets? Are you here to redeem some tickets today? Oh, redeem. There's that word again. I looked bewildered up at my friend's dad, and he said, Yes, Smith, thank you. He said so confidently. What price was he going to pay to, get, to redeem these tickets? After all, all I knew about the word redemption was what I learned in Sabbath school. They had told me that it was Jesus' blood that paid the redemption for sin. But that redemption was for humanity, and we were just going to get tickets. My wandering attention had become laser-focused on what was happening in this box. They moved past boxes A, B, and C, and they moved all the way down to the ones that said P, Q, R, S. S, S for Smith. That's the box we wanted. As my dad's friend reached into his pocket and he pulled out his driver's license and a piece of paper and the official looking people behind the table gave us three tickets. And they seemed satisfied because they gave him the three tickets and they gave him his ID back. And as my two friends, my friend and, my, and his dad walked away, I stood there, confused. 
How simple a transaction. And what, what's going on? Like, what happened to the, this idea of redeem? And I never met, met Will. You know, I, in my confusion, I felt a tug on my shirt. Can I tug your shirt? I felt a tug on my shirt. And I turned and I looked, and it was my friend. He said, let's go, dude, as he handed me my ticket. I was satisfied. Although I was very curious about this whole redeeming process and will call, I was fine because I had a ticket. I had a seat in the football game, and there was a football game about to happen, and I was going to go. And you know, the rest of that day, I don't remember any of it. I don't really recall any more of that day. I just remember this thing that was going through my head about redemption and how I had so many questions. But the same thing could be said about the curiosity I had about what Jesus did and the redemption he did on that first resurrection Sunday. There was so much that I scratched my head about. How did he do it? And why was the cross necessary? And why did he have to die to accomplish my redemption? So many questions. Until one day, I felt a tug on my heart and heard a kind, familiar voice. I looked down to see, as it were, a ticket placed in my hand, that I have a seat, a place to call my own, as a blood-bought child of God, redeemed by Jesus, so that I can enjoy the rest of my life here and eternity with him by my side. You see, without my friend's dad knowing how to get to this mysterious place called Will Call, those tickets would have just sat in that box. We would have never got to go into the game if he hadn't known how to get there. Our shouts would have never gone along with all the other screaming fans. But would we have really been missed? Who knows? You know that from the beginning of the world, Jesus chose you and gave himself to be your ticket so that eternal life could be put into your hearts? He knew the way to Calvary, and he brought you with him. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. If you are like I was, mostly confused and yet overflowing with curiosity, do what I did. Open your hand and receive the ticket. But how could someone care so much about you to include you in something that you hardly understand? I guess that's, that's just what love does. You guys can go back to your seats. Bentley Morris. Bentley has been preparing for quite some time for baptism. He's been excited about it. And when we, when we studied Romans 6 and we studied what baptism means, I could see it really coming to life in him. Realizing that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All the things have become new. So today, Bentley, we're going to be burying the old Bentley. And we're not bringing him back up fixed. We're bringing up a new person in Christ. Amen. Same body, same memories, but a new person in Christ. That's exciting, huh? So, Bentley, you ready for this? Yeah. All right. We've already talked about this before, but you love Jesus with all your heart? Yes. 
You want to become a new creation in Jesus? Yes. All right. Let me ask if any of his friends or family member would like to stand in honor of this decision of his. Look at all those people standing. And you know what? Everybody else is your family as well and the family of God. So, here we go. Bentley, because of your love for Jesus and your desire to put the old Bentley to death and have a new life in Jesus Christ, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rejoice, but I know someone is rejoicing even louder. That is the throne room of heaven. Shall we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come on Bentley? Let's do that. Baptized with water and the Spirit. Father in heaven, we have all celebrated this commitment. And now we pray as one family that you would fill Bentley with your Holy Spirit that he would be led by your spirit, that he would walk in your spirit for the rest of his, his days, and that you would reveal to him the spiritual gifts that you have given him and how he can use those to honor and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, one way that a lot of people request baptism is those little connect cards. If you have seen this commitment, be like, I would like to talk about being baptized. We actually have a baptism coming up in a couple more weeks. Uh, another one on um, April 20th scheduled. And so um, we are looking forward to that. If you would like to be baptized, if you'd like to, to explore that with us, just talk to Pastor Benji or myself or just fill out one of those connect cards and on the bottom there's a thing that says, I'd like to be baptized. Fill that out, put it in the offering box out there, give it to one of us or however you like to do that. And we would look forward to journeying with you through this commitment. It's time to uh, get ready for our morning prayer. So don't forget to bring those cards down. Let's sing together, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Father, what a privilege to be here in your house on this day. We're grateful for this opportunity, grateful for your love, your grace, your forgiveness. We ask that you would forgive our sins, forgive us where we've disappointed you this past week. Help us to go forth and do a better job of representing you. We can do that if you, with your help. When we come together, we have many things to be thankful for. We're grateful that uh, Marsha Westerbeck is home and doing better. Many other praises, many things that we ask for your help, we beg for your help. We pray that you would be with Roger Hopkins. Be close to him. Give him healing and the courage that he needs. We remember Sandy Carney, the journey she's on. And there are many others, many needs. Each of us have needs. And each of us have a savior to meet those needs, to give us the courage and the faith in the healing that we require. Be with our pastor as he speaks. 
Give him your words and power to preach. And go with us going forward into this coming week. Bless our efforts. Help us to turn people towards you. Use us in this week to accomplish your good. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We ask him in Jesus' name. Amen. Sabbath. For today's scripture, I'll be reading from Genesis 11, 1 through 4, King James Version. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a pl plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. It has been a blessing already this morning, amen, church? Turn in your Bibles, if you, already, if you haven't already, to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And that's where we'll be uh, spending just a brief time this morning as we get near our wrap-up of Genesis. We've been on a journey, and we're not going to preach through the whole book of Genesis this series. This is focusing especially on Genesis 1 to 11. And uh, if you don't know what's happened before that, uh, just go read, there was a flood. And now we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 11. I, I want to remind you of something uh, that I've been talking about this whole series, and if you haven't caught up, that's okay. The Old Testament tells its story as the story, or, or rather as a part of that ultimate and universal story that will embrace the whole of creation, time and humanity within its scope. Christopher Wright goes on in Old Testament Ethics. He says, in other words, in reading these texts, we are invited to embrace a meta-narrative. I know that's a big word, We're, but a, but a, a meta-narrative claims to explain the way things are, how they've come to be so, and what they will ultimately will be. In other words, the Bible is using some of these themes and narratives as, as a universal truth that then is traced through the biblical narrative. And the Bible writers, under the guide of the Holy Spirit, um, are, are, are riffing off of or hyperlinking back to these narratives, these meta-narratives, and they're, and they're riffing off them, and they're playing with this idea. And so uh, writers that come later are meditating on earlier scripture that they find and are reading. And so under the Holy Spirit, they're, they're looking at this and saying, hey, what's going on? And, and in Genesis, it's no different. Obviously, in Genesis 1 and 2, God created the heavens and the earth. He created this hot spot. This Eden narrative, this Eden place where God and man can dwell together intimately and face to face. Amen? Yeah, that, that's what God really wanted in the beginning. And, and, and then when the fall happens and all this stuff, this happens, we are then separated at that moment, kicked out of the garden. There's something crouching at the entrance, at the door to the garden, to the space, that wants to consume us, that wants to empower us, that take over us, who, whose desire is for us and is not healthy for us, and is calling us away from Zion, away from the garden spot. And so this whole time, God in his wisdom is trying to get back to, to this, this plan. He's trying to get us back to that connecting point where he can dwell with us face to face. Where Hebrews calls, of, calls it that we can dwell behind the curtain. That we can be raised up and seated in heavenly places. That's, that's what the scripture says. 
And, and so the whole time, this, this reality here, the, the Garden of Eden, is God's ultimate goal. And that in Revelation, when it talks about this new creation, the new creation actually is reverting back to the old creation. Not this, but that. The first original idea of man and God dwelling together in intimacy, in, in, in collective dominion and agreement. Like we were put in charge of this. We were to be his priests, his prophets, his, his kings. And we were made in his image to be his image bearer. And thus, thus begin the journey back. In fact, over in in Genesis, as we read here, Genesis chapter 11, turn there if you haven't already, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, we find out what happens after the flood. God, in his wisdom, and, and, and if you want to go back and read the flood narrative, please do so. It's a beautiful story of God, what I call, and what others have called, God's severe mercy. That God actually, by destroying the world, resets that which he's trying to get to. And if it was left up to mankind, it says back in Genesis, in Genesis 6, God looked at their hearts and all of their heart was evil. And then after the flood, it says God looks on man's heart and it is evil still. But what God did is he reset it because if left up to our own demise, we would have never, uh, humanity would have never gotten to the cross. Think about that. That left up to humanity, we were, we were speeding down the, the, the toilet bowl of life so quickly that God actually, in his severe mercy, had to stop it. That's how wicked it was. And it had to reset so hard. And people are like, oh, that's so unfair. And I'm like, no, no, God, God in his love for us, in his mercy, actually knew that we were going to destroy ourselves, that we were going to end in death, and it was going to end. It was, the, it was the end. But God, in his severe mercy, wanted life for his creatures. And so he goes back to that idea. Here in Genesis chapter 11, we have now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. By the way, it's what we would call uh, today, we would call it Iraq and Baghdad. That's, that's this region. And, and spoiler alert, my title is A City That Never Sleeps. This city that, that becomes here is Babylon. That, that's where this is going. And, and so here, here we have this, this reality that's happening. They, they settle in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butum for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops and its heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. But, but I want to remind you that this was God's plan. This was God's plan. It wasn't cities. God says, hey, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and do what? I want you to fill the earth because you are my image bearer and I am going to fill the earth with my image so that way people know when they come into contact with an image bearer of God that they are to worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And so this idea of, of a village and a city was this. And I'm going to remind you of this because this is, this is key. And if you don't remember this, you're going to miss it. it. That, that this, this town, this little village was, was God's secondary plan. Eden was his first. This is what he turns to and he says, I want you to go this. See, Ur refers to a permanent settlement without reference to size or claims. None of our modern terms, such as city, town, or village, adequately convey the meaning or mental picture contained in this word. Not only is there a difference between the modern and ancient city, there were differences between the ancient cities themselves. They go on, making definition even more difficult. The primary distinction, and this is what you need to know, the primary distinction between a city and a village is that the former city had a wall. 
That's the distinction. That this is what was known as a city. It could be any size. If it had a wall, it was a city. If it didn't, it was a daughter of one. It was the daughter of one. And, and so when you read the biblical narrative, and, and again, this is a theme that, that follows and traces through, you're going you're gonna to start hearing this. And I preached a sermon a little bit of, a, of Cain went out on his own and, and, and didn't believe God, and he settled and, and he built a city because he did not believe that God was going to protect him because that's what the wall is for. The wall is for protection. It's going to say, hey, I have collected, I have gotten, I have gone and, and conquered and done everything I could. I have collected everything, and I'm going to build a city around it because I'm going to keep those out that are mean me harm and I'm going to keep in that which I have created. Did you catch that? I'm going to keep in that which I have created. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity, Pathfinders, I know there's a fire building honor, but I, I grew up and I, I was in Pathfinders. I was Pathfinder of the Year one year. I'm a master guide. I, got my, I can't fit in it anymore, but I used to have a suit I fit in. And, and so I... I remember the Pathfinder honor, and I, ah, I loved fire. There's something about building a fire that just, like, oh, hey, you? as a man, I was like, I have, I have built fire. I am amazing. And, and this one time in college, my friends and I had gone camping, and, and, you know, when you get a bunch of guys together, our collective mentality, our maturity decreases, and our IQ decreases as well. At least that's what it was with me and my friends. Maybe you guys were different. I don't know. I just, whenever, I was like, man, we were not very smart. But anyways, so children, when you hear this story, so listen now, do not mess with fire, okay? Point of the story. But, sorry, parents, but... We had gone camping, and we were out here on the Okoye River. You guys, if you've had the opportunity to go to the Okoye, and there was a camping spot we'd love to go to. And we, we hiked in. We uh, got our camping spot, our tents all set up and everything, and, and we had our water source. We were right by a beautiful stream, and we had filter that would filter the water, and, and we're standing there, and, you know, what's the next thing you got to do? I don't care if it's 105 when you're camping. You're going to go start a fire. Why? Because that's what you do to survive in the wilderness. And we were in the wilderness, obviously, even though the road was right there, our car was right there, and obviously everybody was right there. But still, we were like, well, let's start a fire. So we built a fire, and, and the goal is always like, can you get a fire started with, like, with no matches? Can you get it to, you know, with just wood? Or can you? And, and we were like, no, 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 we don't mess with that. We're going to get the fire started with white gas. Now, white gas is cooking, like what we use for, like cooking, our our stoves would have it, we'd put in white gas. It wasn't like unleaded or, uh, and again, young people, please don't play with fire, thank you. And and so we decided we're going to get this started with white gas, and you just poured it, and it's flammable, it's not like hugely combustible and that kind of stuff. So we got the fire going, and it was this beautiful fire, and we're like, look at what we have made. It was amazing. And look what we have provided for ourselves. And we sat and we cooked on it. And, oh, it's so much. And, you know, your night comes down and the fire is glowing. You get to see the glow. And after camping, you smell like smoke. You know what I'm talking about. There's, there's something to that. And so, and so we're, we're sitting there by the fire. And the next day, we, we, got, we found this huge log. And we said to ourselves, I wonder how big... We can make this fire. It's a great idea. Young people, again, don't do this. And so we, we started to make the fire bigger. And then we found this bigger log. And we found one so big that it's not going to fit all in the fire. So we used what we called a, 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 you know, a poker stick. But as you slowly feed the log into the fire as it burns, right? It was huge. It was this massive log. And it was sticking way out of the fire. And, and, and it was burning. And we're like, that is, is so beautiful. And as... We got the end of our trip. The fire was still going. The log was still way out, sticking up about that high off the ground. And us, our powers combined, looked at each other and said, we're, we're done with our trip. We don't need any more white gas to cook on. Why are we bringing the white gas back? Let's start to see what this light, white gas will do with the fire if we, like, you know, put it on the log and let it run across the log. Let's see what happens. Young people, don't do this. But we thought to ourselves, okay, we're going to pour the white gas on the fire and see what's going to happen. 
so one by one, we started to pour, and, and the fire would catch the very end of the gas on the log, and it would race down the log. And then we said to ourselves, let us jump over this fire, because we are amazing. So we, one by one, were jumping over the fire, and see how high it can go without burning. We were so smart. And we felt so accomplished. And, and the Bible says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. Because Genesis here is trying to lay a narrative down, and, and, and it's trying to get us, in, in my opinion, to, to meditate on this and to understand what, it, what does this mean for us? This idea of come, let us make a name for ourselves with, and build a city. Verse four, then they said, come let us build ourselves a city with, and a tower with its tops in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And, and read with me as it goes. And, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they will have all one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one's, one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. They, they said, come, and a lot of stories just focus on the tower. You've seen them in your storybooks that it's this, it's this you know, spiral, whatever, or it's like the leading, but most likely it was a ziggurat. It was a pyramid that, would, that was incredibly high. And, and, and culturally, I just want to like kind of inform you, if you don't already know this, what this meant. You, you see, again, the city is a walled enclosure. It's saying, let us, let us build ourselves a city. Remember, it's the city that's the focus. Over and over again, the city is the focus. Yes, there's a tower, there's a ziggurat. But it's, it's what the, what's around the ziggurat. It's a city, it's a walled enclosure that is keeping in the resources, the power. The what, look at what we have created. Look at what we've done. And it becomes a false narrative that is then used over and over again in Scripture. In fact, I wish, I wish they would do what, what they do everywhere else is, is Babel is Babylon. It's the exact same word. And, and, and the place they called it, they called it was Babylon. And, and, and a little later, when, later in Genesis there, you'll read Nimrod was the founder of Babylon and, and Nineveh, the the, the the rival, the enemy of God's people was the city, was these people. It became the offspring of the snake. You see, again, Cain and Abel, offspring of the woman, offspring of the snake. Cain was the first builder of a city, and now there's an, and, and he, he settled in the land of, of Babylon. That's where he settled, in Shinar, and, and, and that's, that's what's happening. And now the flood happens, and what do the people do? What do the people do? As quickly as possible, they get together and say, hey, we're not going to, we're going to settle here. This looks fertile. This looks like that we don't have to trust God because whatever is here, I can keep for myself. And, and look what we have done. I'm going to build a city. I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put a wall around it to keep those out and to keep our goods in. And it becomes the symbol. It becomes the symbol of the offspring, the city that never sleeps. It becomes a symbol of what God doesn't want. Victor, in the book of Genesis, Victor Hamilton says, the only reference to building a city in Genesis 1 to 11 is the incident in Babel, come let us build ourselves a city. Here the whole city, building a tower, building, tower erecting project is one that God condemns. God condemns this act. And, and here's why. You've got to understand what they're doing. The, the tower 
Yes, it's because God, they, you got to remember what has just happened. The flood just happened. God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with the people. I'm going to make a covenant with the earth. He makes it with every living thing, animals, plants, everything. He makes a covenant and says, I will not destroy again that which I have recreated. And I'm going to put a rainbow as a sign, as the mark of my covenant with all you. And as soon as possible, humanity disregards God's wisdom and grace and says, God, I don't believe you're going to do that. I'm going to actually build myself a city for my own protection. And I'm going to build a tower in it. That, that way, if it gets higher, but you've got to remember what the towers represented. The towers represented hot spots, the place where heaven and earth. And if I build a dwelling place, because Babel actually means gate of God, they are building a a gateway for God. So if I can get it high enough, and, and then I'm going to dwell with God, and so that way I'm appeasing God, and, and, and so that way I, when I go up on this, this ziggurat, I am safe because I have now look at what we have done. We have built a city for protection because we don't trust you. We've built a tower because we don't trust you, and now we look at us. Look at all that we've accomplished. Look what I bring to the table. In Isaiah 21, 9 and 10, this, this city Babylon begins to be used as a symbol that you will hear about in Revelation. And behold, here comes riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answered, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And all the carved images of her gods he has shattered to the ground. He goes on, Isaiah goes on, Oh, my threshold and winnowed one, what have I heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I announce to you. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. That's the three angels' message. That's, that's the revelation. That's, that's like our, that's our text as Adventists. Like, we are the three angels' message, right, church? Like, that's what like, gets, our, it gets our jam going. And here in Isaiah, it be, it's a pattern. It says, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Like, this has happened. Like, it was back then that it fell, too. And so, it, but, but if it's fallen back then, how can it be alive now? And that's what I'm saying. It becomes a pattern that Cain built himself a city, a Babylon, because he did not believe in God's protection. He was going to do it his way with his God. And then Nimrod as soon as the flood happens, God resets. Nimrod builds a city whose name literally is Babylon and does the exact same thing. Come, let us. And I love the biblical narrative there in Genesis. It says, go back there real quick. Go back there to Genesis. It says in, in, in chapter 11, verse 7, it says, come, let us go down and confuse their speech. In other words, do you, do you get the joke? That no matter how big of a city and how big of a tower you're going to make, God's still got to come down. That, that you have not done anything to bridge the gap because who bridges the gap is God, not you or anything that you can create. Because what you create is idolatry. What you create is paganism. What you create is apostasy. What you create is that God is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the one worthy of worship. He is the one who created you in his image. And anything less is Babylon. And so when God says in Revelation, fallen, fallen is Babylon, it's because Babylon was never meant to exist in the first place because God did not create it. And he wants to destroy this city because God's city is the dwelling place of God and man forever, not Babylon. God's gates are always open. Go to, real quick in your Bibles, if you have it, you can go there. Here in Isaiah Chapter 60, verse 11 and 12, talking about Zion, God's city. There, by the way, the biblical narrative, the meta themes that, that trace through, there is always, it's seemingly two things, the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the snake. You have, you have Babylon, which is the devil's city. You have Zion, which is God's city. You have God's people. You have the devil's people. You have God's mountain. You have the devil's mountain. You have the false trinity. You have the true trinity. In Revelation, they're dealing with these things in patterns of two. One being the true, the other being the false. One asks you to worship. The other forces you to worship. Are you seeing a pattern, church? Here, 
God's city, Isaiah 60 verse 11, your gates shall be opened continually. Day and night they shall not be shut. Look what happens in God's city. The gates are never closed because God's grace is always going out and people are always coming in. That people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom will not serve you, will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid to waste. Revelation 21, it says, by its light, talking about the new Jerusalem, the new Zion, by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And watch, right here, it's just here in Revelation 25. And its gates will never be what? They'll never be shut. They're always going to be open. So this city that's, that's not really a city because the city actually has walls and whose gates are shut. But the city is always open. And there's this going out and coming in and there's this blessings and, and, and there's the receiving of God's blessing and there's a pouring out of, of praise to God. And it's this, this interchange of fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him. Worship God. That's the whole, it's not, come, let us make a name for ourselves because we are worthy. Look what we have made. As we poured the white gas on it, we got bolder and bolder. It started getting higher and higher. And we're like, ooh, and we had a big thing left. And Casey, my friend's like, I'm gonna pour it as fast as I can, but I'm gonna put it in the fire and run it this way because before we were running it that way where we started in the end to get it there. And so, but he said, I'm gonna start it at the fire and then pour it out where. And, and we were like, that's a great idea. And so he starts it in the fire, and as he's pouring, he's not paying attention, because I'm telling you, this log was high and it was long. And as he's pouring, he's watching the end of the log. And we're watching, all of a sudden, that little stream, that little trickle in the log is caught fire. And it's now racing down the log in case he's not paying attention. And as he's pouring, all of a sudden, we see the fire go up, up the stream that he's pouring inside the bottle. Oh, it was awesome. It was the best thing I've seen in a long time. Yeah, right, Tony? It was amazing because all of a sudden he freaks out. He throws the bottle because the bottle's now on fire, which now spews fire, liquid fire, everywhere on him. It drops to the ground. Now fire is all around. We're running away from Casey because Casey's on fire. He kicks, the, he kicks the bottle. It now spins around liquid fire everywhere, and it's on his pants, and we as his friends are laughing. He's okay. He's alive today. Doesn't have much leg hair, but he's alive. You know, it's, but, but that's, that's the, 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 look at what we've done. You see, everything's okay until it's not. You Babylon seem like a good idea. It sounds like, hey, that's what we should do. We should build, we should protect our homes, right? Like we need to make sure we're safe, but, but, but do you not see what we're doing? When we, when we, when we create our own Babylon, or when we dwell in the original Babylon, we're not trusting God to take care to meet his covenant promises because, because there's destruction coming. Keep going here. Jeremiah 51, 6 to 9 says, Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine, therefore the nations went mad. It keeps on. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. Perhaps she may be healed. You see, you see this, this thing that, that, that is Babylon that started in Genesis echoes throughout all of Scripture as the symbol of apostasy, as a symbol of, of people saying, look at what we have done because we do not trust what he has done is enough. Suddenly, Babylon, we have, would, would have healed Babylon, for she was not healed. Forsake her and let us go each to his own country. For her judgment has reached up to the heavens, has been lifted up even to the skies. 
Jeremiah 51, 24 says, I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying man. Why? Look, look, look at Jeremiah here. Look at this text. It says, behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain. Now, Babylon it was a city. It was a city with a fence and a gate and, 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 a, and, a, and a tower reaching up because it was the gateway between heaven and earth. They had created the gateway. And, and, and I'm sorry, Jesus is the gateway, by the way, if you don't catch that. That at Jacob's ladder, when, when the ladder is going up and down between heaven and earth and the angels are going, and Jake, Jacob wakes up and takes this rock and, and puts it up on an end, anoints it and calls it Bethel, the house of God, he realizes that something is different there. And Jesus comes as the fulfillment of that and becomes the gateway between heaven and earth. He's the one that fixed the broken riff. He's the one that brings the Eden to us reality now. He's the new creation that we become, the baptism that just happened. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a waking from your death into a new life because of what Jesus has done. But here in Jeremiah, behold, I'm against you, O destroying mountain declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt mountain. In Revelation, does it talk about a mountain being thrown into the sea? A burning mountain being thrown into the sea? Maybe that's talking about this Babylon. Babylon has fallen because God in his wisdom and his justice has now come down. We are the saints under the altar crying out, how long? And God is saying, look, I am doing that which I have promised to do. Babylon the human gateway to heaven, the confusion that that has caused, it is no more. And I am throwing it into the sea. It goes on, no stone shall be taken from you for a corner corner and no stone for a foundation, but you shall be a perpetual waste, declares the Lord. In Revelation 14, 8, another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The great city was split into three. Revelation 16, 19 says, The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Revelation 17, 5 And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. What are the towns called that feed the city of Babylon? What are towns called? Daughters. She's the mother of prostitutes. Babylon becomes the symbol from the very beginning of apostasy. And in the end, it's not going to be any different. There is a city that wants you to dwell there because it wants you to think that you're not enough. That, that what God has done is not enough. That what you've done is not enough. In fact, it wants to make you scared. It wants to make you fearful. It wants to make you think there's something that is in between you and God. And you're right, his name is Jesus and he is enough. That's what scripture says. But, but the devil wants to create doubt. He wants to create misconfusion. He wants to say, no, look at what you've done. Go out and build or now go abide in this Babylon. And that's why in Revelation, God calls her, his people out of Babylon, out of apostasy, out of this, because Babylon is the, the mother of harlots. Sorry, young people. It's the mother of these prostitutes. And, and, and by the way, Revelation, when it talks about 144,000, it talks about a people who have not defiled themselves with women. It's because we have not defiled ourselves with the prostitute or their daughters. It's the city and the towns that fed her. It's, and what, what's, what's happening? Turn to Revelation real quick. I get excited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. You see, right before 19, 
in 18, two to eight, it says, and he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable thing. And it goes on, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passions of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Because when you look at it, you think Babylon has everything that we need and want because it looks like they're okay. But here in, 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 in Revelation 19, it says, after I heard all this, I hear heaven crying out, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are just and true. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted even the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of the servants. Once more, hallelujah, the smoke of her torment go up and up. Because all of this stuff that happens before that happens in Babylon, that, that it has done and it has been a part of, is about worship. You see, Babylon forces you to decide. God offers you to decide. One's going to do it with fear of death. The other promises that death has no more sting because the power of death has been taken away. So the saints and the martyrs in Revelation, when they're crying out under the altar saying, God, like, how can this be fair? It looks like Babylon is thriving. You look at the world, can you not admit that you look outside and you're like, the Babylon is, is thriving. Like, it feels like Zion is dying. It feels like our church is dwindling. But out there, everybody's having a, you know, a fun old time. But God in Revelation says, I got this. The cup of iniquity is going to be filled. And what's interesting is the very kings and nations that feed Babylon in the end are the one that actually consume her. God is looking for us to be in a dwelling place with him forever. That hallelujah, the great prostitute has been avenged, who corrupted. Hallelujah, the smoke goes up forever. Hallelujah, there's a great multitude that, that the bridegroom is reddering. All of this language over and over again. And there's this language that keeps going. Because it's a call out in Revelation 18. Pay her back as she has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup mix. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, mourning I shall never see. But there's this, there's this ongoing movement of this woman that persists throughout time a force, a darkness epitomized by a city ceaselessly endeavoring to lure humanity, ceaselessly trying to get you away from the divine precepts. When God says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, he wants you to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. He doesn't want us to build a city with a gate to keep everybody in, to make sure we're safe. God's got this. He's gonna protect his church. You don't have to, church. God's got this. But you see this city that's urging humanity away from the divine precepts, urging reliance on personal wisdom and desires as the epitome of goodness. In other words, this city, Babylon, says, look what we have made for ourselves because look what we think is desirable in our eyes. It's, it's Casey. Look, we're having fun. We're pouring fire on a log, church. It's a lot of fun. Young people, don't do it. It's terrible. It'll burn you. Okay? But we thought it was a lot of fun. And it was a lot of fun until it wasn't because all of a sudden the fire catches up to the gas. And then what do you have? You have chaos. You have confusion. You have Babylon. Babylon was a good idea, but it wasn't. 
Because we think in our own power, in our own wisdom, this looks like a good idea. Eve looked at the fruit and it was desirable. Cain thought that God's mark wasn't enough protection. You see, this, this, this Babylon city urging reliance on personal wisdom and desires is the epitome of goodness. This city, parentally known as Babylon, now witnesses its dominion fall as individuals, you and me, are summoned forth from its grip into the sanctum of God's city. So my question for you this morning is very simple, church. What's your address going to be? Is it going to be Gallatin down the hill? I'm just joking. I got grief when I lived in Gallatin up here. People were like, oh, you live down the hill. I was like, but it's so, no, not, not good enough, evidently. And the same was with Babylon. It's not good enough. God has set before you a choice. He set before you life and blessings in Zion. And it doesn't matter what looks good or looks desirable because the opposite of the blessing in life is death and curses and confusion. And you have a choice. What is your address going to be? Father God, this, this grand narrative of Babylon can sometimes be overwhelming. But Lord, you have set this in Scripture as markers for us to realize that when we dwell in Babylon or that even when we get close, when we start to play with fire, it doesn't end well for us. And Lord, you have done everything. You've given us everything for life and godliness, Scripture says. So Lord, may we faithfully choose you. And if anyone here looks around and finds themselves in, in a spiritual Babylon, in, in, in the power, in, 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 that, in that apostasy, Lord, come out of her my people, I pray, is what they hear so that we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever because ultimately in the end, that is what Zion is about. It is about a city whose gates are always open, who doesn't need a sun and doesn't have night because we are dwelling with God forever. So, Lord, may we faithfully choose that which you have set before us as a choice, not out of fear, but out of reverence, reverence and worship is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord have its face shine upon you and give you peace. And now it's our time, which we always love to do. Bentley, are you here? Come on up, Bentley. Come on up. We need to vote you is. into into service, and then we will invite the church family to come up and uh, celebrate that with you. And so, Bentley, you're taking your time. I will continue to <laughs> belabor the point, but all, all those in favor of the motion to accept Bentley into worship and family, say amen. Amen. Amen, Bentley. And here's your certificate here and a Bible here. Let me be the first one to welcome you. Welcome, and y'all are welcome to come up and greet our new brother in Christ. Amen.